Good afternoon. Welcome to the Library Research Award at American University. My name is G. Davis and I'm the university librarian and I am super excited today. Um, I don't know if you know, but this is our first in-person Library Research Award since uh, pandemic began. And we've been waiting for this moment. We survived how many? Three? Three virtual uh, um, award ceremony, but it's nothing like having, you know, guests in house and then meeting face to face and celebrate our best research papers uh, produced by our talented students. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to acknowledge some folks who made this um, event possible. Mary Mintz, our humanities librarian and also the coordinator of this event. And she did a lot of work uh, coordinating and then uh, finding judges, etc. Claire Young over there, uh, she's the special assistant to the university library, librarian, me. <laughs> and, um, she did a lot of logistics and you know coordinating uh, marketing and then reaching out to uh, partners. So thank you so much. I also want to shout out uh, our faculty sponsors. Do we have any faculty sponsors here? Oh, thank you so much. I know that um, your support and your guidance meant a lot to our students, and then I, I, I'm sure they benefit great from uh, your support and uh, your uh, encouragement. So thank you. Also, finally, judges. Do we have a panel of judges today? There you go. Thank you. I understand this year was particularly challenging because, you know, as we are preparing this uh, event, we were a little bit worried, right? Students were coming from the remote and then, you know, we are not sure how students feel and then how quality uh, uh, research papers we're gonna rece receive. Well, to our surprise, we had a lot of competition. So you, you should feel all good about your products because I know judges had a lot of hard time selecting uh, the winners. So thank you so much for your uh, support and your time. So research is an essential component of American University's mission, and it is really important strategic priority of the university library, as you can imagine. Research enables our students with opportunities to engage in original intellectual investment, and it also um, provide opportunities to contribute to the advancement of knowledge in various uh, academic disciplines. Uh, conducting research and writing about research processes and outcomes allow our students to develop critical thinking skills through applying various research methodologies, you know, collecting and then analyzing um, the data, and then come to the conclusion based on their research findings. This is absolutely critical process of knowledge generation. It also provides students with a deeper understanding of their subject areas and opportunities to work with their uh, excellent faculty here at American University. I know every student already today here has a faculty sponsor who supported their work and wrote a recommendation letter to our judging panel so that they can really advocate our students' academic achievement. This afternoon, we are here to recognize the dedication, hard work, and excellence that have gone into producing these award-winning research papers. These papers are testaments to the incredible talent and academic commitment of our students. I like to really express my deep uh, gratitude for the families and faculty sponsors of our awardees. Your support and encouragement have been instrumental in helping our students achieve and pursue their goals. 
and we are grateful that you are able to join us today. To our student, I want to say that your hard work and dedication to research have gone, have not gone unnoticed. Your achievements reflect the excellence that we strive for at the American University. And we are very proud of having you as part of our academic community. So shortly, you will hear from our all our awardees in three categories. The first category, we will uh, honor our best writing studies paper. Uh, the winners, uh, we, we focused on their writing skills and then research skills. Um, students learn from the WRT 100 and 101 and 106 courses. The next category is best undergraduate papers. This highlights the students' interesting uh, research topics and research uh, processes and high quality writing found across all disciplines at American University. Finally, we have a very special um, the award. It's called um, W. Donald Bowles Award. This is uh, endowed by uh, our uh, uh, Professor Emeritus Bowles. And this, is this has a specific um, intention and topics that we are celebrating. Uh, the topics are ab about wealth, uh, inequality, poverty, and other topics that really um, consequences of economic disparities. So we're going to have eight awardees. And I look forward to learn more about their um, processes and their uh, research products. And also at the end of this event, we have a little bit small refreshment so everybody can engage and um, learn more about a student's work. So Mary, let's, let's have our students get awarded. First, for the Writing Studies Award, we'll ask Callista Schlossman to come forward, along with Natan Kamalan Block and Yvette Now. And Callista <laughs> has won the third prize, Natan the second. Thank you. Any bet the first? Uh, Calista. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, we have also. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. Good job. Thank you so much for all your work. Here you go. Congratulations. Yes. Good job. Congratulations. Good job. Make sure you all get some pictures. Yes. Okay. Who's first, second, third? Try to do more left and right. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, let's hold up the glass thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we, we decided having a crystal. Let's see if you can turn the certificate this? around. Oh, okay. We'll get this really pretty. All right, Jeff. Okay, you okay. ready? <laughs> Set all smiles right here. Ready, set? Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Great job. Thank you. Stay young. I can wait. So um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, hear from our students their you know their their research and then topics and then the description of their research um, process. So uh, and then we're gonna continue that. So who's who starts? Callista, yeah. uh, come on up, Callista. Callista Sloshman wrote a paper titled No Knock Warrants as Death Warrants, Threatening Cons Constituent Lives. She was sponsored by Professor Todd Jones. She's a freshman with an intended major of international studies at American University. She was born and raised in Glendale, California, and says that she is very excited to be now living in Washington, D.C. 
her faculty sponsor, Professor Jen, said about her paper, in gathering 10 useful sources, Sloshman showed her willingness to take academic initiative and to go beyond the bare requirements of the assignment. Moreover, I found that she made excellent use of those sources, integrating them into her argument in a way that demonstrates potential for future academic success. Callista, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very nervous. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, well, I'm just going to start off, I guess, by giving my paper kind of an introduction why I chose the topic. Um, in the dawn hours of March 13th, 2020, various officers from the Louisville Metro Police Department forcefully, forcefully entered the residence of Breonna Taylor, a local EMT, and her boyfriend Kenneth Walker, on suspicion of drug possessions. Even though officers claimed to have announced themselves, video footage of the entry as well as various accounts from next door neighbors reveal otherwise. When officers burst into Taylor's home, Kenneth Walker, Taylor's partner, withdrew his legally registered weapon and fired in self-defense. The officers responded with reckless conduct, firing so many bullets that littered Brianna Taylor's home and ended up killing her. This senseless attack on human life, as well as details that have emerged about the falsification of evidence that there were drugs in Ms. Taylor's home, completely false statement, revealed to us the truly insidious nature of the no-knock warrant that ended an innocent medical worker's life. Despite Brianna's mother, Tamika Palmer, exhibiting tremendous courage in the face of this nightmare situation and coming on national television to explain what really happened to her daughter, there has been laughably limited accountability for the officers who perpetrated this brutal attack. When I began my college writing course last semester, I knew that I wanted to focus on this injustice for my research topic. So I began collecting data from op-eds and other editorials for a rhetorical analysis paper, and later compiled more academic sources for an annotated bibliography. When I started to research the history of no-knock warrants for the final paper, the news, I found that the news kind of failed to describe their actual origins. The most helpful source that I ended up finding was actually a detailed report published by the ACLU that not only explained how no-knock warrants are part of an insidious process of extreme police militarization, but also explained how systemic change, excuse me, but how systemic change is needed to avoid the loss of more innocent lives. The statistics of the efficacy of no-knock warrants were astounding as outlined in this report, being that most of them are actually ineffective at meeting their original goal of capturing contraband or actually apprehending dangerous criminals. The other sources whose information I investigated touched on important legal concepts that actually showed me how nuanced the situation around no-knock warrants is. Through these studies, I realized that in many states there is actually a legal statute known as a castle doctrine that defends the right of homeowners to defend their property. These sources, one of them being a legal dissertation, helped me analyze the history of no-knock warrants through this legal guise and gave me more of a political and legal perspective. This nuance helped me further my argument that no-knock warrants really should be abolished and actually became one of the central points of my research paper. The other important part of the paper was acknowledging the reality that these no-knock warrants target communities of color as they are a part of policing that is rooted in systemic racism. There is ample research on the fact that excessive police militarization targets specific groups of people, but actually there's more of a limited amount on the effects of no-knock warrants specifically. Despite these obstacles, I located sources that helped me explain my points, specifically an article published by the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy and independent reporting from the Louisville Courier about actual data collected that shows that black residents in the city of Louisville were actually targeted uh, disproportionately more than white residents in these no-knock warrants. For this reason, focusing on the work of independent journalists and you know, independent think tanks was so important for this project. There are plenty of academic reports published about police militarization, but because there's li more limited focus on actual no-knock warrants, focusing on independent reporting became a very um, important strategy for me drafting this paper. 
I also focused on sources that uh, looked at the counterclaim. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that there are still officials in law enforcement, lawmakers, policymakers who oppose completely abolishing the no-knock warrant. There was one source that I examined that was from the 1980s, so a little bit older, that looked at the potential effic efficacy of these no-knock warrants to apprehend very dangerous criminals. However, coming back to the evidence and evaluating it all, I realized that the argument that no-knock warrants could be potentially effective for apprehending dangerous criminals was questionable given the statistics that they are actually rarely used for these exigent circumstances. It is important, I've learned that it is important to view an issue that has such a complex history from both sides as much as the evidence points us in one direction. Through this research process, I really deepened my understanding of how truly, of how complex policy issues are in the United States, as well as the need for awareness to be raised about this issue. If we are going to persuade policy and lawmakers about the importance of this issue, we have to amplify the abundance of evidence that already exists on police militarization, as well as furthering research specifically about the effects of no-knock warrants. Thank you. Thank you, Callista. That was an excellent summary of your paper. And now we'll ask Natan Kimmelman Block to come up and tell us about his paper. Uh, Natan is a sophomore from Silver Spring, Maryland, so he's local. And he has created his own major within the College of Arts and Sciences. And I think it's just fascinating. He has an official title for it. It's called Critical Studies in Land body, and spirituality. And it takes classes from the CRGC, anthropology, health, and religion to complicate understandings of how different forms of power inform how the three are understood and interacted with. His faculty sponsor said he most admired Natan's keen use of text to create his project. Specifically, how he used text in multiple ways to fashion his project, while also using a great blend of scholarly, popular, and primary texts to accomplish this. And for a first ever in this competition that I can recall, we have not just one paper that has a music component, but two. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Natan. Sure, thank you. Um, so my paper um, came about in the second semester of my freshman year. It was, I was able to do um, such, well, I guess a recognized job with it because uh, my professor allowed for um, a lot, he, he gave us a lot of time for it. And in months of preparation, I was able to look at first scholarly sources, which was um, required by the prompt to look at 10 scholarly sources. Um, and I knew that I wanted to look at music and specifically music in the Arab world because, well, music, I've been grounded in kind of that discipline for at least a decade. I've been playing music for a while and I wanted to bring that into the classroom, especially with a paper where we were given such free range on what uh, we wanted to focus on. Um, in the first semester of freshman year, I took an intro to the Arab world class and it very, and it very much inter interested me so I wanted to continue in that discipline through um, this paper. Um, the Arab world, the Arab Spring was a collection of uprisings in the early 2010s. And I wanted to look at specifically the musical component of that. Now music is kind of like a general thing. It's in conversation with plenty of other forms of art and resistance and um, regime backlash. And I wanted to look at all these different things, but I wanted to ground the paper um, both in the theoretical discussion around it and in the music itself. I included many um, direct quotes from songs, many, bi uh, many biographies of individual artists. I wanted to ground this paper in the individual songs and artists that were most, that were the loudest on the streets. Um, and I also wanted to look at um, how music was used by the regimes as um, methods of backlash against protesters. So I started the paper looking at musicians such as Rami Assam with his song Irhal. He came out of uh, Cairo. 
Um, and this song kind of shows a lot of the influence that the Egyptian rev revolution had more specifically and kind of the influence of all these revolutions in tandem with each other had. Um, this song was about the Egyptian regime. It kind of named Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak in the song. But despite that, um, it was heard throughout the Arab world because um, despite the being multiple uprisings, they were all in tandem and influenced um, in conversation with each other. And I think music was one of the um, forces that united um, these uprisings. I also, a lot of, I wanted to look at the coverage of Arab world music and a lot of it, especially coming from the United States, from Western Europe, was looking at um, hip hop. It was called the hip hop revolution in popular culture. And a lot of it was looking at um, kind of like hip hop, it was looking at Facebook, social media as the like sparks that kind of, um, that lit the flame over the, or under these uprisings. Um, and I read an article that complicated this understanding and said, what do Facebook and hip hop have in common is that it's placing the US as the place where hip hop originated, the place where Facebook and social media and a lot of social media companies originated on the side of the protesters. It's saying, look, the US came in with all these cultural influences and um, provided the means for fighting like oppressive regimes instead of looking at the US as, um, as a force that colluded with the regimes and financially backed them throughout their existence. Um, and since the Arab Spring have continued to, and continue to this day to back regimes in power in the Arab world and around the country, so, or around the world. So that was an interesting article that complicated, um, I forget the name of the article, but it complicated my experience and my understanding of these Western, more Western um, views of music within the Arab world. And finally, I wanted to look at um, how uh, Arab regimes either effectively or ineffectively use music to um, backlash against the protests and against the uprisings. So we see in um, Morocco where there was, it was not a part of the Arab Spring, there was minimal constitutional change in Morocco and um, I argued that a lot of this, or an influence of that minimal change was music and the Moroccan regime, which um, the Moroccan re regime is kind of a different, it's a different animal than a lot of the other regimes that were in the Arab world. It's based in tradition, it's a, they, they have a king, it's a more religious and um, identity defining experience, while in other nations in um, Tunisia and and um, Egypt, these were kind of decolonial regimes that came up after the 1950s. So just the longevity of Morocco's regime helped it stay in power and also its use of music. It adopted West or like pop music. It adopted um, hip hop as, and paid artists to make music that defined nationalism and defined Moroccan identity within the regime. So um, that was, their way of countering this kind of musical uprising with a musical backlash. Um, in Egypt, on the other hand, we had an interesting, I found one song that provided kind of an interesting story. Um, and the song, it was written as a decolonial song in the 1950s that kind of unified Egyptian nationalism against the British colonialism and then it was adopted by the decolonial regime as a nationalist Egyptian song. And finally, in the Arab Spring, it was sung on the streets as, again, defining Egyptian nationalism, Egyptian identity as revolutionary, as breaking down systems of oppressive power. Um, so I thought that song provided a, a nice story as well. Um, I think. Yeah, I thank Professor Mumao, I thank uh, G. Davis and Mary Mintz again, um, and all of you, thanks so much.
Yvette now is the first place winner in the writing studies competition. And you can tell that she had stiff competition going into <laughs> this. Um, she's a sophomore from Sharon, Massachusetts. She's majoring in biology and minoring in Spanish. She works with the neuroscience department to research the genomic effects of estrogen levels in zebra finch hippocampi and is the president of the Brain Club. <laughs> and her professor, Professor Jeremy Wade said, in, in giving her very high praise, as you know, students are in the difficult position of being scholars without the benefit of years of experience or much of an idea how professionals operate. This often makes it difficult to see themselves as members of our communities and understand their responsibilities and opportunities as researchers. Her paper represents her journey from a hardworking first year student to someone who has earned her seat at the table through diligence and originality. I cannot think of a better example for other undergraduate researchers. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I just want to start this by briefly thanking the judges who are here um, from this category, as well as the entire library staff. And then a very special shout out, of course, to Professor Wade, um, without whom this paper would not exist. So Professor Wade's Spring Writing 101 class in 2022 completely changed how I approach my research process, despite the fact that the only papers I write these days are lab reports and not humanities essays. His course was formally titled, Whose Land is Our Land? The Rhetoric of American Music. So the requirement for our big freshman year paper was to examine the theme of American music within the context of our own academic discipline. As an intended neuroscience major, the obvious connection would be talking about how the brain processes music and then throw in some random connection to America at the end. So it seems easy, right? Well, something Professor Wade always emphasized was knowing the conversation that you are about to enter. Generally, as a student interacting with any type of material for the first time, there needs to be an, uh, an acknowledgement and a baseline attempt to understand the legacy of the research that came before. His main takeaway was that this shouldn't prevent anybody from contributing and making their voice heard, but there also needs to be a bit of an understanding of what has already happened before you enter the discussion. So with this in mind, I went to look at a few papers about the brain and the music and see if it was a topic I was interested in and very quickly realized that it was not something I was about to enter anytime soon. I mean, I hadn't even taken a neuro class yet because I was still a freshman and I hadn't had much exposure to scientific literature. So again, it was a conversation in a language I didn't understand and I was not about to go learn that language in one month. So where did I go from here? As you, you all can probably predict, I pulled out the good, reliable Gen Z fallback, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so, at first it was completely a joke, like, yeah, but after preliminary Googling, I realized that this was actually the link that I had been missing between the two seemingly unrelated topics of neuroscience and American music. So in short, my research quest questions sought to study the neurology behind social media addiction and use that to understand how TikTok's popularity and app structure changed the ways that unknown, up and coming, or world famous singers and songwriters could directly promote their work to a target audience without interference from record labels. So I sort of had a thesis, great. But what were my sources that I was gonna use? I very quickly found out that there were no published studies on really anything for my research question. I was at the intersection of three very, very different topics, and it seemed like nobody else had found themselves standing there before. So I broke it up into three sections to make it a bit more manageable. First, neuro. Second, TikTok. And third, the music industry. And that allowed me to consider, consider each entity separately and then tie it together at the end. So first, I studied the relationship between short form social media, attention, and addiction. I could go to any one of my friends, look at their screen time, and have plenty of quantitative data to show me that there was an addiction to TikTok. Um, but unfortunately, this wasn't published data that was usable for a research paper. And despite spending hours on Google Scholar, PubMed Central, meeting the university librarians, I didn't find reputable sources that gave me the hardcore data that I was looking for. In retrospect, this dilemma actually forced me to look beyond the easy sources and find creative ways to back up my argument. So in the absence of data that explicitly showed a correlation between TikTok and addiction, 
I explain the role that dopamine plays in typical reward feedback loops and how this could be a proposed mechanism for social media addiction with the acknowledgement that I was still a freshman and did not really understand most of what I was reading. <laughs> um, in the absence of evidence that described how TikTok has significantly decreased attention span on the individual level, I turned my focus to population trends that had already been published. I used a study describing how Twitter hashtags cycle through the trending page more and more rapidly in recent years in order to demonstrate a collective population-wide inability to focus on one particular topic for a long period of time. By applying these findings to TikTok, I showed how interest in a trend grows, peaks, and dissipates at accelerating paces, which basically reflects individual level addiction to the app in the form where people spend so much time on it that content has to be refreshed 24 seven. So the second part of the paper demonstrated how any user could latch themselves onto a trend to showcase their own musical talents to, um, to an audience of millions when they otherwise would not have this platform to display their abilities. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this because most of it was actually spent writing paragraphs about how TikTok works in terms of collab videos, musical duets, and popular audios. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to assume that most of us under understand what that means. Um, and we're also going to start getting into some pop culture references. It will start sounding far-fetched, and believe me, I had the exact same thoughts that you all are going to have when I was writing this. Like, I was sitting at my desk and I was like, this isn't a great paper. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so hopefully everyone can follow along. So the sources that I actually used for the second and the third sections were TikToks themselves. Why not go back to the origin of my entire question? And quick shout out to those 24-hour library chat feature, which taught me how to do MLA citations of TikToks in my moments of desperation. Um, so a couple examples I included were user Lauren Paley, who gained some fame from singing renditions of Disney songs in a stairwell. I'm sure we all remember the song ABCDEFU, which originated from a completely unknown 17-year-old singer-songwriter. And this original track now actually boasts almost 1 billion streams on Spotify alone. And the songs Say So by Doja Cat and Lottery by K Camp were catapulted to fame because they were used as audios for popular dances. And we all probably remember the material girl or maybe we got lost in translation memes. And if you don't, that's actually a representation of how quickly these trends appear and disappear. Everything I'm talking about was popular a year ago when I wrote this paper, but it has since been replaced by millions and probably billions of different videos. So up to this point, I had sort of established the neuroscience behind addiction and the TikTok and the music background. But there was still a missing piece of the puzzle that was going to be able to tie it together. And one day over spring break, I found it. Singer-songwriter Charlie Puth and his TikTok series behind the making of his single, Light Switch. I know it sounds crazy, but again, bear with me. Um, for those of you who might not recognize that name, you might know some of his songs, See You Again or We Don't Talk Anymore. So capitalizing on the chaotic and unpredictable nature of TikTok as a whole, Poot's account consists of duets and stitches of fan videos, blind reactions to fan comments, displays of perfect pitch and his musical, ner his musical nerdiness, but it also serves as a place where he can discuss more serious topics like failed relationships and struggles with hate comments. Overall, he is able to cultivate an easygoing, natural rapport with his followers and cast off the PR persona, making his followers more likely to interact with his content, which boosts it through the algorithm patterns to reach an exponentially larger number of For You pages. So if you didn't understand any of what I just said, I'll translate. He just knows how to get more people to watch his videos, which makes him more famous. <laughs> So the very first of the Light Switch video saga consisted of a video in which a repetitive triplet cycle was used, where Puth proposed a concept, vocalized the noise, then played the idea formally on a computer software program. So whether this was a conscious de decision on his part or not, all of his content was structured with rapidly punctuated sounds and clips layered one after another, which set up the perfect format catering to the short viewer attention spans and the desire for instant gratification. So essentially, Puth played right into the hands of the social media feedback loops that I previously established, where he gives users the cycle of dopamine release that they are accustomed to receiving after they open the app. He cleverly continued this format in order to show the song's five-month creative process, which was a wildly successful method. Within mere hours of its formal release, the song had already reached over one million streams. And despite so much of it having already been revealed online on TikTok, users who had seen the birth of the track and followed its musical development over those five months um, were so engaged and held a personal stake in its success that they went later on Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube and streamed it. And I think it's now almost at like 400 million streams. So that gives you an indication of how well this works. So we're all here, and y'all are probably sitting, why does this matter? Um, what are we doing here? So his videos show how artists can maintain their personality and autonomy in the face of traditional radio and TV interviews, 
where artists rarely get a say on how their speech and image is framed. By taking advantage of shortened attention spans and using the intimacy and authenticity afforded by the content sharing structure, Puth gives other artists the perfect blueprint for reclaiming power within the music industry, where they can release content on their own time and become famous without relying on the goodwill of producers or record labels. In a time where Puth had all but faded from the popular stage, he manipulated the TikTok users to invert the hierarchy of the music industry, staking a large claim in the personal control of his music career and rekindling a massive, massive public following. I'm going to finish with one last piece of wisdom from Professor Wade. Um, with every single assignment and reading that we did in the course, he encouraged us to define the exigency of the work. So in other words, why did the world need to hear this particular topic at this particular moment in time? When I wrote this paper, it was in the context of spring 2022, and I cast a pretty hopeful look towards the future of the music industry and the potential benefits that this app and the model could bring. However, one comment he had given me on my rough draft was actually to, quote, reframe for future scholars. Your thinking will still be relevant in the coming years, so edit with future readers in mind. So I just like threw in a sentence to fill, fulfill the requirement, get the rubric points, whatever, that said, <laughs> that said potential ethical problems arising from misuse of user data must be examined with the goal of establishing guidelines for product, service, or song promotion within the app. So I guess we both had some sort of foresight about the whole TikTok congressional hearings, because I wouldn't have put that in there either way. <laughs> um, so again, with a year of hindsight, it's now important to consider what might be happening to the music industry and the careers of these up-and-coming American artists who have been relying on the TikTok blueprint for their publicity, and in some cases, their livelihood in the face of this type of ban. Is the industry going to revert to its pre-TikTok days, or is a new app going to pop up? Will a ban on TikTok once again revert our attention spans back to their set points, or will a replacement app only continue this trend? It's a question that might be more easily answered with the increase of papers and reputable news organizations that are foc focusing their journalism and research efforts on the potential outcomes of a ban on the app. But of course, at the time, I didn't have any of this context. All I knew was that TikTok had evolved to become the largest collaborative platform in the world, and its impact had been overlooked and undefined in the context of the neuroscience and the music industry for far too long. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was terrific and so timely, as you noted. We'll now call forward the winners in the general undergraduate category. In third place, Molly Lopri, sponsored by Professor Horace Gardelow. In second place, David Vostok, sponsored by Professor Kimberly Cal Myers. And in first place, Robbie Jones, sponsored by Professor Tony Wright. Molly, if you want to remain up here, that would be great. <laughs> Molly is from Freehold, New Jersey. She is majoring in international service with a minor in biology, and she is in her second year at AU, but she's making rapid progress, and technically she's a junior. Um, her professor, Bartolo, said, I would like to impress upon the app application committee that what is particularly striking about Molly is that a, as a sophomore, she learned and can execute advanced research methods, skills that my former, more experienced PhD students had to learn to complete their dissertation research. As a sophisticated, <laughs> high praise indeed, they're hearing this for the first time. As the sophisticated nature of her research methodology demonstrates, she is among the top 1% of undergraduate students I've instructed over my 27-year career as an academic researcher. Thank you. Thank Molly. you. Hi. Um, so 
As you can tell by the title of my research paper, it is a little boring for some of you. Definitely not as interesting as TikTok. But, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> great paper. No, I'm serious. Um, so I wrote this for my advanced international research class, the SISU 306 class, which is um, the second portion in a two semester course. So I started this fall semester 2022 and I actually just submitted my final paper on Monday. So while probably the most difficult and rigorous class that I've ever taken, it honestly changed everything I thought I knew about research and has really been my greatest learning experience so far. And I'm really grateful to my professor, Professor Bartolo, for teaching me. Um, essentially, this paper is a research design for how I plan to carry out the research for on democratic backsliding and human rights, which I really do hope to do soon, and I'm trying to apply for grants, so fingers crossed. Um, my research process began, as I said, last semester when my professor, I went to his office hours, Professor Bartolo, entirely confused about where to start, how to even begin. I had gotten some bad feedback on my initial topic proposal paper, and I was just scared. Um, so. I also went to a librarian early on who helped me identify like the relevant terms and the sources uh, that would best guide my project. And then with their guidance and my passion for human rights, which is my primary thematic area in my major, um, I started my research. So I began simply by reading, which is my professor's biggest advice is just to read. Um, so I started by reading and I familiarized myself with the debate on human rights and then created an extensive literature review that focused on the causal factors of human rights and so what do people identify as being associated with human rights repression. Um, from there it became clear that during my review there was a nonlinear relationship between human rights and democratization. Um, one study even coins the relationship as the more murder in the middle hypothesis. Um, other studies also found that democracy and human rights only had a relationship to a degree, but did not specify to what degree that was. And then others even found that the effects of democracy changed during the years of political transition. So to me, the relationship between democracy and human rights that I had previously thought was well-founded and well-accepted in the scholarly community became entirely unclear. Um, these studies led me to the major finding of my literature review and essentially the basis of what I hope my research to be, um, that states with intermediate characteristics of democracy are the worst human rights violators. So with this theory in mind, I realized there was a significant gap in the literature, and that's where we all start with our research, a research puzzle, a gap. Um, about the degree to which democracy has an effect on human rights, especially now considering the contemporary phenomenon of democratic backsliding, which is essentially when, which is what we're seeing now when states have moved from being democratic to um, not so democratic. So like for the US, for example, is uh, in many indicators of democracy, like the democracy house index has regressed into not as great forms of democracy and they're losing democratic characteristics in their society and governments. So this unexplored field drew me to my topic, again, the effect of democratic backsliding on human rights repression. Um, so during my literature review, which again ended up being the bulk of my paper, I organized sources according to their independent variables, such as economic sanctions, population growth rate, participation in conflict and war, and so on, meaning these things have been identified as causal factors for human rights repression in nations. So then I later used the same sources to not only help operationalize and conceptualize my own variables, but also as controls in my research project. After conducting the literature review and developing my own theory about the effect of democratic backsliding and human rights, I began constructing my research design, which was the final paper I submitted for this. The topic of my research class was mixed methods, so as such, my research was based on the convergent parallel mixed methods research design, which incorporates a small n qualitative case study phase, accompanied by a large n quantitative n phase, and then a convergence phase at the end. Uh, as a result of this multi-step design, my study asks three questions. What is the effect of democratic backsliding on the regression of human rights in a given nation? How are the human rights experiences of individuals affected by democratic backsliding? And to what extent do the quant quantitative and qualitative results on democratic backsliding converge? From these questions, I hypothesize that democratic backsliding will have a positive effect on human rights repression and the way people experience human rights. So essentially, the more democratic backsliding there is in a nation, the worse off human rights will be. So for my initial quantitative phase, I plan to use a cross-national time series on ordinary least squares regression uh, with a sample of 75 nations to estimate the directional effect of democratic backsliding on human rights repression. In this phase, I consider democratic backsliding to be an independent variable. However, I'm still working with my professor on a better operational definition so I can more accurately measure it in my statistical phase. And then I consider it again human rights, my dependent variable, and I'm using indicators to score countries according to the Siri data set, which scores a country on a scale of one to 30, uh, based on indicators like civil liberties, the rights of women, the rights of the press, extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings, and things like that. Um, I've also included seven control variables, all of which have been identified as having a relationship with human rights repression based on my literature review. So for the second phase of my research, I conducted the initial steps of a small n qualitative case study, 
So in this part, I use the same variables, but focus on more qualitative conceptualizations rather than um, operational definitions. So not numbers, more concepts. And the main difference here was, was with my dependent variable, human rights, and how I would collect data. So for this, I plan to um, use unstructured interviews in both an individual and, un and small focus group format with conversations guided towards participant experiences rather than coding and measurement like the Siri data set did in my quantitative portion. So the case selection process was arguably the most difficult part of my design. I got extremely frustrated doing it because it's very difficult to pick the right cases. Um, so since I'm still working to develop my own theory, I use the most similar systems design to select three cases. This means that all of the cases differed in their levels of democratic backsliding and their levels of human rights repression. However, they were all the same for the seven control variables I used. So just a quick note for this initial research, I used the Democracy Index database and rankings to identify the levels of democratic backsliding as I'm still working on my own definition for that. So after a lot of background research, I landed on Mali, Serbia, and India for my three cases. Mali had the highest rates of democratic backsliding in the last 10 years, as well as the highest rates of human rights repression of the case studies. Serbia had a moderate level of backsliding and a low level of human rights repression, while India had a, finally had a low level of democratic backsliding, but a moderate level of human rights repression. Afterwards, I would use pattern matching logic to link my theoretically proposed pattern to the observed, to the observed pattern and the collected data. And right now, based on my preliminary case study research, it appears as though my theoretically proposed pattern regarding democratic backsliding does match the observed data. So again, for the last phase of my research, the convergence phase, since this is, after all, a convergent parallel design, um, essentially it is the comparison of results from the large and small end portions to see if they match. So in the event that they do not match, which I don't think is likely right now, based on my initial findings, especially the case study, I plan to revisit the large end statistical model and analytical methods used. So that's essentially like wrap, that wrapped up my paper. And then as I said before, this is only a research design paper, so much of the actual statistical analysis has not been done yet. Uh, but I would really like to continue this project and I hope to get the opportunity to do so soon. I'm still working with my professor uh, and I hope we can work on it this summer. Um, I also just wanted to say briefly as I wrap up that this project really taught me how much there is to learn. Professor Bartolo taught me how much I don't know. <laughs> and I'm really incredibly grateful that I discovered this passion for research and I hope to continue just researching and learning everything that I can. I'm really looking forward to learning more about mixed methods research and the knowledge research has to offer all of us, whatever it may be. So if you have any questions afterwards or anybody has any feedback, I would really love to talk about it. Thank you. David Crosstop is our second vice winner. He's a junior at American University where he's an international relations major and a Lincoln Scholar in political thought. David is currently um, an intern at the Council on Foreign Relations, specializing in Asia, Asia studies and international relations theory. Before that, he served as an intern at the US Department of State in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. In 2022, he was a National Defense Fellow with the Ronald Reagan Institute and the Alexander Hamilton Society. He's from Deerfield, Illinois. And his professor, uh, Gregory Aftam Dillian, had so many compliments to pay to David and to his research approaches and his paper writing and so on. But I've singled out one thing that he said that was so impressive, I'd never heard of this before. He asked David to return to the next section of the course to give a guest talk this semester <laughs> on how to do original research and how to write an outstanding paper. So we look forward to hearing from you, David. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. I just want to begin by thanking everybody so much for this award. It truly really means a lot. I also want to thank, in particular, both Professor Robert Adcock and Professor Gregory Eftendillian for all their support throughout the research and the writing process. Now, when I first got to AU, I was incredibly interested in classical realist political thought in international relations. And I knew that I wanted to dive into it in some depth. I was also incredibly interested in the writing and the thinking of Hans J. Morgenthau, who was a prominent classical realist academic from the 20th century, and Henry A. Kissinger, who was the scholar statesman that also was a classical realist. 
And I quickly noticed that although both men share a similar philosophy, or they share an identical philosophy, they found themselves on opposite sides of the Vietnam War. Morgenthau was a public critic of the war effort, and Kissinger has largely been credited with escalating the conflict. Now, this didn't make sense to me. How can two men who share the same philosophies end up on opposite sides of the war effort? So to do this, to research this, I started by examining both of their academic and their philosophical writings. Then I compared this with their writings on the Vietnam War. So I looked at their books, I looked at articles they wrote, uh, and I even went to the Library of Congress and did a lot of archival research in the Hans J. Morgenthau papers. And I learned a lot from that. Now, Morgenthau bases his entire philosophy on the assumption that human nature has a lust for power, that humans love to dominate one another. And he calls this the animus dominiandi. And in such a world where humans uh, try to assert their will on others, states can only feel secure in the world if they just pursue their national interests abroad. We shouldn't be pursuing moral policies or values-based diplomacy abroad. We should, only be, we should only be pursuing a narrowly tailored security interest abroad. Now, Henry Kissinger kind of looks at the world and has the same lens. He sees that, he agrees with Morgenthau that you know, people act that way, that human nature has this lust for power. But for him, there's a way out. He bases his philosophy on the 19th century concert of Europe system. And he says that if power is diffused and power is balanced among several states, there'll be such a deterrence to prevent war from breaking out that there will be greater peace and stability in the world. Now, both men seem to be speak speaking the same realist language. And anybody familiar with uh, international relations theory will know that both the national interest and the balance of power are core realist precepts. And in fact, Morgenthau speaks about the balance of power, and Kissinger speaks about the national interest. But Morgenthau's understanding of the balance of power is different from Kissinger's. Morgenthau ultimately says in Politics, Among, in Politics Among Nations, which is his most famous book, that pursuing an equality of power, even if it's in coalitions of blocks, can be dangerous because people are, are imperfect. And we can devalue ourselves and overvalue our adversaries. Moreover, in, uh, in defense of the national interest, Morgenthau even goes as far as saying that the balance of power isn't done for the sake of this perpetual peace that Kissinger thinks of, but for the sake of pursuing our own interests. Think, for example, how the US became the regional hege hegemon in Latin America. The US helped create the balance of power system in Europe so that no European country was strong enough to fight, for, fight against US interests in Latin America. So these are very different conceptions of the balance of power. And this is how Vietnam War plays out differently. Morgenthau looks at the Vietnam War and says, there are no actual US vital interests there. In fact, this is just a, a project of, this is just a liberal crusade to promote our values abroad. He even went farther and said that this is against US interests. To him, communism was not a monolithic force. Just because, South Viet just because Vietnam might turn into a communist state did not necessarily mean that it would be beholden to the Russians or the Chinese. In fact, he said that Vietnamese nationalism was so strong that it would fight against it. But the war effort, he feared, would break down that, that nationalism. It would welcome greater Russian influence. It would welcome greater Chinese influence. And so he pushed back against the war and said that the US should immediately leave. Now, Kissinger looked at the war differently. He came in and trying to be this 19th century European statesman, he said that he thought he could create a balance of power between the North and the South. He saw that the North was winning the war, and he thought, you know what? If we just applied massive pressure, we could create a greater equilibrium of forces. So this is when the escalation of the war effort comes in. He hoped to bring both sides to the table through, as a result and sue for peace and stability in Southeast Asia. Now, ultimately, he failed. Um, now, this seems like a rather academic question. Why, why should we care at the end of the day about the way Morgenthau and Kissinger saw themselves and their philosophies, and why should we care about their approach to the Vietnam War? But it has real consequences for the way we teach international relations theory in academia. Oftentimes, we teach realism as if it's just one linear line that starts with Thucydides, and it climbs up to Machiavelli, and then makes its way to Hobbes, Morgenthau, Kissinger, Waltz, Mearsheimer, etc. But we know that that's not entirely true, and we know that all those people had different philosophies themselves. In fact, we have different categories 
classical realism, structural realism, offensive, defensive realism. But even within those schools of thought, it's not perfect. Uh, classical realists, Morgenthau and Kissinger, found themselves in bitter disagreement with one another. So realism, then, isn't necessarily a set of policy prescriptions. It's more of a lens, a pessimistic lens, but a lens nonetheless that we can use to view the world. And with that lens, we can interpret the world and make policies from there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm being joined at the podium by Robbie Jones. Robbie is um, a senior and will be graduating at the end of summer this year. He considers his hometown to be Chesapeake Beach, Maryland. And he is enrolled in the dual degree track. And he'll graduate with degrees in both neuroscience and data science. I'm going to let him read the title to you. <laughs> because it's going, not right now, but just in just a minute. It's going to give me many opportunities to mispronounce scientific terms. <laughs> Um, and again, his faculty sponsor, Professor Tony Riley, uh, had lots of many highly complimentary and positive things to say about his research and his paper. And he stressed the originality and the initiative that Robbie took. Um, and he added some memes. He says, Professor Riley says, he drafted the manuscript of his work and submitted it for publication in Experimental and Clinical Psychopharmacology. That's a journal title. The submission got excellent reviews and requests were made for revisions. Robbie made these on his own and I am happy to say that the paper was just accepted for publication. This is phenomenal that an undergraduate has a paper being published in a scientific peer reviewed journal. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you guys are doing well, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, Conditioned Taste Aversion and Conditioned Place Preference in Female Sprague Dolly Rats. Something like that. It's a very long title. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, being up here is a surreal experience, um, and I'm so honored to have been given this award. Uh, this work really is the culmination of my independent research here at AU, and you know, there's a cliche saying that uh, Research, the path of research isn't linear, and I can firsthand tell you that is completely true. Um, my journey at AU started when I was a junior in high school. Um, I got to come to campus and tour, and I got the opportunity to talk to Dr. Anthony Riley and Dr. David Kearns. Um, when I got to campus, I started my first semester freshman year in a professional research lab with Dr. David Kearns, and um, I learned about you know how to read a paper, how to collaborate in a professional setting, um, and did some initial research. I then, my second semester, began an independent reading in um, Dr. Riley's lab under the supervision of Dr. Katie Nelson, who was one of his PhD students. She was the first to analyze a synthetic cathinone, or a bath salt more commonly known as, um, called alpha PVP. I basically read everything about her dissertation, um, learned the methods, understood it, and that took me an entire semester just to learn about it. Um, I had had plans to move forward and start my own research starting sophomore year uh, when I officially transferred into Dr. Riley's lab. But as many of you know, COVID hit through a wrench in the plans. And so I worked on doing um, literature reviews on serial and concurrent use of these different drugs. Um, I initially started that paper and I thought that was going to be, you know, my work. Um, but then I transferred to a different to a different project in which I was going to look at the pre-exposure effects of THC on alpha PVP following in the footsteps of uh, Dr. Nelson. I, during that time, um, trained with Dr. Haley Minky, a PhD student that actually just finished her program at AU and learned the methods that I used, which were condition taste aversion and condition place preference. Um, they're used to assess the rewarding and aversive effects of drugs to gauge their abuse potential. And so in my research, looking at um, the pre-exposure effects of THC on alpha PVP, I happened to reach out to a corresponding author for one of the papers that I was reading. 
um, to try and gain some additional information or data that I thought could help strengthen my argument. His name was Dr. Barry Logan, um, and to my surprise, he responded and told me that, um, for lack of better terms, my project was outdated. <laughs> um, Alpha PVP had peaked in around 2017, and he had told me that a new compound, Eudolone, was just striking the illicit drug market, and that um, not much research had been done on it. So I did my own little amount of investigation and found that you know, almost nothing had been published on it. Um, one study found that about 27 different EDM festivals, they looked there, they found Eudolone in around 25% of the samples. Um, and then further on in 2020, it was published that it was the seventh most prevalent drug seized in the United States. But nobody in my lab had heard of, had heard of it, not even my um, professor. And so I came to him and asked him if I could switch my project, even though I was a couple months into research already. And he agreed to oversee the investigation. And so after that, I went into the initial protocol phase of writing. I researched up and down, shout out to the research uh, subject specialists at AU for helping me comb through the internet because when I say there was almost nothing on this topic, so I needed to pull from related compounds, everything that I possibly could to make this argument. Um, I submitted that, finished it, and submitted it to the IACUC, got it approved, and next was the problem of funding. And so I was nominated for the Cold Water Scholarship here at AU. And I worked for months trying to perfect the scholarship. I sent it in, and I didn't get it. <laughs> um, but luckily, there was also the Summer Research Awards at AU. And I used that work that I had poured months of my time into and submitted there and was granted funding for summer research, which was fantastic. And so what came next was what I thought would be the hardest part of this process, the physical research part. I spent 31 days in the basement of Hall of Science for maybe anywhere from four to seven hours a day, just putting rats in and out of cages and doing organic chemistry homework in between my runs. <sighs> it was a great time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so after that, we finally culminated all the data. Um, I had to learn almost a new language, statistics. Um, I had to run all of my data through SPSS. Um, I had to figure out how to graph up all of my different results. And, you know, once we got all of that done, came the actual process of writing the manuscript. This took so much time, paragraph by paragraph. Um, you know, I, I don't even want to list the amount of sources that were on this paper. But, um, yeah, we went through and, you know, with the help of my lab editing and Dr. Riley's advice, I got through and wrote this manuscript came next the process of actually submitting it to a journal, which was daunting. I had you know, worked with uh, Dr. Haley Menke prior, learning the techniques that I applied in this actual project, and that's what led me to my first two publications, which was really great. Um, but I had never actually gone through the process of being the first author, going to submit my paper to an actual journal. We picked experimental and clinical psychopharmacology based off of some of the other work that other undergraduate students here at AU had done in years past. Um, and I submitted, and like was said, um, we probably waited like a month and a half. We got back that they thought my work was really interesting, that they thought it was relevant, that Eudolone really was this new drug that was spreading all the way up the East Coast that nobody had heard of. Um, it was actually interesting. I, I saw like a little bit in Fox News or something from my friend in Florida who I had told about my research, and she was like, oh my god, it's terrible, but look. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we got back the that. If you guys have never seen what it looks like to get a publication back with revisions, it's probably like 50 or 60 comments. You have to address every single one with a paragraph to paragraph, completely change your paper, track changes. It was an entire ordeal, but we... Um, resubmitted after everything was done, reformatted all of our figures, basically changed everything about the paper um, while keeping the same you know, basic structure, and then resubmitted. And so before I get there, basically what I actually did in this paper was assess the abuse potential of butylone for the first time. Um, when I first got into this research, there was probably three, maybe two published papers talking about butylone at all, and they were looking at its neurochemical properties but nothing about its abuse potential had been um, looked at. So, you know, we found that there were significant condition taste diversions, significant place preferences, which I will spare you um, <laughs> fully explaining, but I can proudly say that I was one of the first to um, assess that Eudolone had an abuse potential and that it was something that should be looked at more carefully. Um, and the whole idea, I guess you could say, behind bath salts is that they're designer drugs. They are 
created to mimic the effects of more traditional drugs of abuse, such as MDMA and cocaine. And what typically happens is that these are cut into different drugs to try and make them um, cheaper while still maintaining those same effects. And they're much more risky. The adverse health effects are much less explored, as I'm kind of explaining now. But um, yeah, and I recently got back the uh, confirmation that my paper had been accepted for publication. And hopefully in the coming weeks, I will be able to send all of you the DOI for the paper. <laughs> but yeah, um, as a final thank you, I'd like to thank the library for this award. I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences and the NASA DC Space Consortium for funding this research. I would like to thank my main mentor, um, Dr. Anthony Riley, my secondary mentor, Dr. David Kearns, and the countless PhD students, uh, Katie Nelson, Haley Mankey, and Shui Huang, who gave me guidance throughout this whole process. Um, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was terrific. We've been waiting for you. Uh, your paper is the first I can recall in science that has won at this level. We have two remaining awards, the Bowles Awards. So we'll ask Tyler Godding, the undergraduate winner, and Amy Cross, the graduate winner, to come to the front of the room. Congratulations. Here we go. I better know. <laughs> Congratulations, Amy. There you go. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, 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 yeah. I thought you were gone. Okay. Because <laughs> he's, he's in demand. Do you want Amy? One, one oh, I have to be here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Ready, set. Tyler will ask you to present first. Tyler won the undergraduate Bowles Award, and he's originally from Stoneham, Massachusetts. He's majoring in CLED, as it's popularly known around campus. It's communications, legal studies, economics, and government, uh, based in the SPA. And uh, <clears throat> Tyler wrote about TAMP which stands for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, Spending on Basic Assistance and State Poverty Rates. And that's the way in which he fulfilled the requirements of the Special Bowles Award. And um, again, praise from his faculty sponsor, Professor Kimberly Cowell Myers. She says, in his review of the prior literature, he exceeded the course requirements to use at least six reviewed academic sources and cited more than 10. He also consulted with Olivia I. <laughs> Please raise your hand, our <laughs> SBA librarian, for help in honing the project and finding the state data he would eventually use for his independent variable. In this way, making use of the library's teaching resources. He has also shown clear evidence of learning and development as he subsequently applied to and has been admitted to the SPA Honors Program and the Combined BA MA Program, where he will continue to use the skills he developed. Hi. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Tyler, and uh, my research is on task spending on basic assistance and the relationship to that um, on a state's poverty rate. Um, so I come from this research uh, with an interest in anti-poverty policy and, and social welfare policy, um, and then specifically in kind of guaranteed income programs. So previously in my writing studies class, I did a very general uh, research paper that looked at the influence of the idea of individualism in uh, social welfare programs in the U.S. and kind of tracking that um, over the course of this history. And when you do that, you end up learning a lot about TANF itself because the idea of individualism and kind of um, that, that work requirements and, and all that is very prevalent in TANF. So when I uh, was in Professor Cowell Meyer's class and um, having to come up with a uh, original research project, um, I went to a lot of different other places that 
I was interested in and scoured the library for uh, data and different literature, um, but couldn't really find anything. Um, either the data wasn't there or it's already been done. So I went to uh, looking at TANF and um, in that I, I noticed that while TANF has been looked at in many different aspects, it hasn't been looked at kind of with this relationship to a state poverty rate. So looking at the previous literature, I broke it down into three different categories. Um, what we know about TANF spending variability, what we know about state poverty variability, and what we know about um, kind of just general welfare programs. So the literature on TANF spending variability, um, what really jumps out is that a lot of it is, is racial aspects. So one study said when a state has a higher um, proportion of African-Americans on its TANF caseload, it's less than on cash assistance when the state generally has a higher population of uh, African-Americans, they're less likely to spend on uh, cash assistance. Um, so that was very clear to me, but no one had ever looked at kind of that effect on state poverty rates. Uh, for state poverty rates themselves, there was uh, one study that looked at a variety of different factors on state poverty rates and found that per capita income, uh, a larger tax base, and as well as uh, ample TANF benefits were kind of primary indicator indicators of a state poverty rates variability. Um, it was actually that study that I kind of also take inspiration from. They looked at the different categories of TANF spending, um, but they said that they should this should be updated um, because they did it very shortly afterwards, and so they thought that there wasn't enough data on it. Um, and then finally, on um, uh, just kind of general welfare programs, uh, looking at across uh, the different programs, uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit and SNAP were seen as the best at reducing poverty, um, along with Social Security. Um, TANF itself hadn't really looked at, been looked at for its poverty reducing effects. Um, so taking kind of all those different gaps together, um, I figured I would take the spending on basic assistance um, and see what relationship, what relationship it can do um, to the state poverty rate. Um, so the hypothesis is that when a state spends more on basic assistance, they will have a, a lower poverty rate than states that spend less on basic assistance. Uh, this was also kind of informed by studies I've read about uh, pilot programs that have done guaranteed income they've given in Stockton, California, and in Jackson, Mississippi with uh, SEED and the Magnolia Mothers Trust. They would give um, some amount of money each month to random recipients um, and see the effects on it. So they saw improvements in uh, economic stability, savings, well-being across the board. So from that, I thought if you spend more on cash, then most likely poverty rate will go down. Um, so this is briefly what the method was. Um, I used a regression analysis just based on the uh, type of data I used. It was uh, spending data taken from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, they just track it uh, on an annual basis. And then the state poverty rate data was taken from the census. Um, so this is just briefly some descriptive data um, for the state poverty rates. Um, if you look at it, you can really see um, that the, the uh, literature bears out with um, New Hampshire having a fairly high per capita income, fairly high TANF benefit amount, um, whereas for Mississippi, they have a fairly low per capita income and fairly low TANF benefit. Uh, so the results were unfortunate that there was no significant relationship between the two variables. Um, so that was something I was hoping wouldn't happen, but sort of was uh, knew it could happen in the back of my mind. So from that, I thought, what did I know about TANF and what did I know about these other programs? And thought that it had something to do with the structure of TANF itself. So it is um, fairly restrictive in um, giving cash assistance, has a very low income uh, limit to receive aid. It has uh, work requirements, time limits, um, and states vary greatly in that. So at the federal level, it's already very strict, and then states uh, can make it even stricter. So my thought was that TANF wasn't kind of bearing out the same as these other cash assistance.
program tab because of its high restrictedness. Um, obviously, further research probably should be done to confirm that in some ways. So looking more specifically at ranking the different states on their restrictedness and seeing uh, how, how that bears to the state poverty rates um, and looking at maybe even just the benefit amounts themselves. Um, and so in sum, I think it kind of provides uh, interesting lessons for policymakers going forward that when you make a program, you know, more universal, more, um, more free in, in how you give cash aid, it's definitely more effective at reducing poverty. Um, so I would just like to thank the library for this award. I'm honored to uh, get it, and I'd like to thank Professor Cowell Meyer for pushing me and, and providing me the opportunity for the research project. Um, and I'd also like to, to thank uh, Professor Yu Hauswitz for kind of inspiring me uh, in uh, my interest in poverty. Thank you. Our final presenter today and the award winner in the graduate category of the Bowles Award competition is Amy Cross. Amy is a dissertation student, a graduate student in our Department of Economics. She's originally from Colorado. Um, some of us had to recuse ourselves, including one of the judges and me, because I've worked a little bit with Amy on her research, and I know she's worked with other librarians too. I'll tell you how in just a minute. Of course, her professor, Dr. Mary Hansen, said about her research into signaling women's entry into male-dominated occupations, evidence from the gender desegregation of the U.S. Army, that she did an incredible amount of research. She did outstanding research. She does outstanding writing. She could not say enough good things about you, Amy. I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but one that I particularly glommed up to is this passage from her paper. She said, Dr. Hansen said, she unearthed and compared every major version of and minor update to the regulations governing military occupations from the 1960s to the 1980s. 6,000 plus pages in all. However, what really makes her stand out on the score is her early recognition that our library's most important resource is librarians. <laughs> <laughs> and she further says, she may know more of you than I do. <laughs> so thanks for indulging me in a little promotion. Here. And thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. Oh, can I get that clicker as well? Thank you. And whoever has the computer, could you just hit Control L to make this full screen? Thank you. Right, so I do have slides because I've given this presentation thousands of times. I'm going to try to toggle it a little bit for a more general audience, and I've kept the map out of it. <laughs> but this is my job market paper, so it is the one that I have a lot to say about. Um, and you know, I definitely know for sure that this research would not have been possible without the incredible heroics of librarians uh, during a pandemic who have done amazing things to find me crazy obscure data and references about the military, which is not a thing, like a very easy topic. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting nods from the audience because I've spent time with you. So anyway, I, I thought you might want to see what came of this. <laughs> Um, which is in its very final stages of research and getting ready for submission to the journals. Great, so first I just want to have a, say a personal note. Um, I was in elementary school in Littleton, Colorado during the massacre at uh, Columbine High School. Um, and I really take uh, the events that have happened here at AU personally this week, right? And I know that the student body, I also acted as a professor, as an adjunct professor while I'm here, I know that the student body um, are really impacted by um, not, not just the actual events and the actual threat, but the perceived threat. And we come here to learn, we come here to better ourselves. 
and to be in the uh, to to show up every day in the face of insecurity and um, a knowledge that the world is becoming less safe for us every day. I just wanted to acknowledge that reality um, and also to say that we're here because we really care about knowledge and we are sh we show up um, in spite of that fear every day. So thank you very much. Is that? Right. Um, oops. All right. So um, I do have three papers in my dissertation, so I want to give you a little bit of context for what it is that I do, and then we'll dive into the paper that I that I uh, submitted for this award. So my dissertation aims to provide evidence that army policies can help change social norms that constrain women's labor force participation and underlie occupational segregation. Women's labor force participation means women's ability to work for pay in the workforce. Occupational segregation is kind of what kind of jobs do women and men do, right? The policy motivation is very strong for my work. The Army missed its recruiting targets by 20% last year and this uh, in the past two years, and they're on target to do so again this year. So I argue that how the Army fills those gaps matters to gender equity in the I'm creating evidence into that policy space. So why, why would a gender economist study the military? Um, first, the Army mirrors and distills the barriers that women faced in broader America, particularly in conservative places in America, right? In the, in the Army, it's still acceptable to say that women are the weak link or that they threaten unit cohesion and mission readiness. That's, that's still a reasonably common thing to hear in the Army. And in the civilian sector, we don't hear that as often. Um, two, the Army fosters a really interesting, persistent duality that we can't ever get rid of. First, they serve a basic human need for national security in a conflict-filled world. I don't think anyone here could argue that we're more peaceful than we were 50 years ago. And B, they foster masculinity with substantial resources. Therefore, they get to actually perform this role as like a long-standing arbiter of social norms. Um, and I think that's really interesting, and I think that gender economists are not paying enough attention to that. So I decided to take it on with my dissertation. Third, the Army is the largest, largest and oldest branch of the military. So this is in response, some people have asked me, well, why not study the Navy? Why not study the Marine Corps? Well, the Army's been around the longest, and it's also the largest, so it's kind of ripe for the picking to, to study that relative to other branches. Demand for soldiers actually impacts civilian labor markets, so it's a really substantial employer. And the Army has persistently resisted having women soldiers, right? So relative to the Air Force, where they've been kind of clamoring for women at times, the Army is one of the branches of the military where we can actually maybe have an interesting policy experiment to study. Um, and this is the last, the final one that I think probably catches my attention as a policy-oriented economist is that the Army is not only beholden to taxpayers in the nation, right? So as a taxpayer, as a U.S. citizen, I think maybe I should be able to understand the impact that my military plays in the issues that I care about in the world. Okay, so that's kind of motivation for my work. A little bit of an introduction to my research question. I'm studying an episode that happened in the 1970s, when the Army expanded recruitment <coughs> and opened blue-collar occupations to women, which happened in 1972. So I'm estimating the effect of that on women's entry into blue-collar civilian occupations, right? So to give you a sense of what I'm trying to think about here, this, um, oh, you can't really see the light, but on, on the left here is an ad for women pr prior to 1972, like during either the Korean War or the Vietnam War, you would have seen ads like this to women, asking them, do you want to have an administrative job? Come work for the Army, you can be an administrator. Well, after 1972, the ad starts to look like this over here on the right, and by the way, librarians helped me find these images, <laughs> okay? Um, and they're very compelling when I'm talking to people. Uh, some of our best men are women, right? And so you see, what you see here is an image of women doing these kind of 
blue color drops. You know, one of them has like a torch in her hand. One of them is in a, actually in a cockpit. And the whole narrative here uh, is discussing that the army is, an is a place where women can have equal opportunity. Um, and they can pursue things that are not actually truly available to them in the civilian sector, right? So what I'm imagining in my research is what kind of impact does seeing this transition have on the civilian public and their, um, their willingness to let women do new kinds of civilian jobs? Okay, are we, you with me? Great. Oh, gosh, that's backwards. Okay, so a preview of my results, and I promised you I wouldn't do any math today, so I'm going to stick to that. So living in an area more exposed to the army does increase the probability that a woman will work in a male-dominated occupation after the desegregation of the army. Okay, so uh, thumbs up on the hypothesis confirmation. Oops, keep it backwards. Um, I have omitted like 20 billion slides from my slide deck, but I have contributed to the literature in two primary ways. The first contribution that I make is to the literature on occupational segregation itself, um, which is a primary driver of the gender wage gap today. So the tendency of women and men to do different kinds of work is one of the primary drivers behind the fact that women and men are paid differently, right? Second contribution of my work is to the, this emerging field of cultural economics, which attempts to explain how cultural shocks can drive economic outcomes. Right, so things that happen in the cultural space can actually impact the economy. This is an example of that uh, applied to, to the gender inequality question. Right. So, a um, little bit of historical background. All right, so, orienting you to this timeline. Below the timeline, we have civilian events. Above the timeline, we have army events. So, in 1964, we have Title VII equal opportunity ban on discrimination in apprenticeships. In 1974, we have Title IX, which impacted women's ability to get um, equal education in male-dominated fields. In 1978, we had Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and the Office of Federal Contracts Compliance Program was established, enabling women to enter to contracting spaces that were male-dominated, right? So all of these things are impacting women's entry into male-dominated jobs. So one of my tasks is to distinguish between those things and my hypothesis about the army, right? So going to the army, we know that in 1945 to 1975, we had two wars, the Korean and Vietnam War. And in 1973, the Vietnam War draft ends, meaning the army can no longer pull men against their will from the civilian labor force and force them to be employed, employed by the army. So I'm a labor economist, so I'll put it in, in that terms, right? Um, well, so what are, what's happening to women during this time period, though? Well, right after World War II, women were actually allowed into the army for the first time on a permanent basis into what was called the Women's Army Corps. So it was contained, it was constricted, it was restricted to a subset of occupations in clerical work and medical work, right? So it was highly, highly regulated subset of the army. Um, and so, yep, so that's what I just described here, these black occupations, um, some of which were allowed for women all the time. A few more were allowed during periods of war only, during mobilization periods. So what happens here in 1972, right before the draft ends, is the army has to find a new way to staff up without drafted men. One of the ways they do that is by allowing women to do new kinds of work. So what I'm not talking about is combat jobs, right? Women are still not allowed to carry a gun. That doesn't happen until far, far later in history. And, but, but things like technical occupations, mechanical jobs, repairman jobs, intelligence jobs, these are open to women in 1972. Oops. And then in 1982, uh, when Reagan comes on board, he says, let's stop this. This is too many women in the military. It's essentially women are just increasing the share 
of um, their, their participation in, in the military just increases over this time period until Reagan says, let's stop, and then it essentially plateaus from 1980s through the 90s. So anyway, so I stopped my study then in the 19, early 1980s because something different is happening in the city. Okay? All right, so I think I've talked about this a little bit here, but essentially the key, one of the key challenges of my research is uh, economists call it endogeneity, right? So we have here, what I'm interested in is how these military occupation restrictions for women influence occupational sorting in the civilian sector, right? That seems like a clear question, but it's not because social norms are actually influencing both the policy and the civilian outcomes, right? So having disentangling that is like one of the big problems of this research that I'm doing. And the reason that I'm studying this particular period in time, gosh, keep doing that, is because at the end of the draft, we have something that's impacting these restrictions, but is not impacted by social norms. Not, not at least on this level. I know there's other things going on for why we ended the draft, but it's not, they're not related to gender norms, right? So, um, so, so my, my research is kind of interesting because when people think about occupational segregation, one of the challenges that they face is that, well, how do we disentangle the fact that women are doing different things than men? Could they just be choosing this? Right? Or is it is there some policy? How do we how do we account for the fact that there is some like free will involved, right? So this, my research is kind of novel in that I have this exogenous shock, this outside source of variation that kind of tests the impact. So how do I get at that empirically? I promise I'm not going to get into the numbers of it, but I think you'll get this. Oh wow, you can't really see that, can you? So I use GIS methods, right? So what you see here in the red are these metropolitan areas in the US that I have data for from the current population survey uh, because of librarians. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, these green stars are the location of military bases, which I also have access to this data because of librarians. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I've mapped out kind of where these places are in proximity to one another. And my hypothesis is that the closer you are to a military base, the closer you are to living to a military base, where you can see a woman doing this work for the first time after 1972, the more likely it is that you'll have exposure to that kind of new way of thinking about things, right? So um, I'm not going to get into the detail, but uh, my results do kind of support this, this hypothesis that I have, which is the gender desegregation of the army signaled a shift in the appropriate role of women workers. Um, my current work is getting really specific with military and civilian occupations, trying to look at, okay, well, here's a, an intelligence base. So is it more likely that women are entering like police intelligence jobs in places right nearby that? Um, that is what I'm actually working on. Like, as soon as I'm done with this presentation, I'll get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I just wanted to add this, this little bit for the librarians in the room who have made a huge difference. Um, when Professor Hansen sat down with me four years ago, five years ago, and said, what is it that you think is driving gender inequality in the economy? I said, look, okay, I think maybe it's something to do with like stuff that we're not even thinking about, right? What about the military? She was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> she, she just started throwing problems at me, right? And I was like, all right, I'm gonna tackle this. And the library was really important in that. So while most economists will come at graduate school and they'll start using library resources just in the form of journal articles and secondary data downloads that you can just click and download and do your analysis, I've certainly done those things, but I've done a whole lot more. And I think um, Mary had mentioned one of them, whoops, keep going backwards, um, that includes primary documents from Congress, primary documents from the Army, and from the Department of Defense. I've submitted FOIA requests to DOD that I've gotten help from librarians over. Um, and Mary mentioned this, every major version and minor update to the regulations 
governing military occupations from the 1960s to the 1980s. Took about two weeks just to locate them, and then about then another two months to understand what was going on in them. Um, so, try basically if you want to learn anything about the military, you really have to have people who can help you find the information that is technically available, but not done in a way that is designed for anyone to read. Right. So the library here at AU has played a massive role in my success in this. And for that, um, I, I would um, thank you deeply, and I'm forever in your debt. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, Amy's ending this session, all music to my ears. Right? <laughs> <laughs> How important the librarians are. But I wanna I wanna say something before we close and enjoy our refreshment over there. I don't know how many of you attended A U and Beyond Experiential Learning Expo. It was incredible. And then every time I attend student research, student experiential learning testimony, I just I was blown away. I was like, how do we how do we highlight these scholars with so bright eyes and so many good ideas, right? And then how do we celebrate their, their accomplishments in this very challenging period, right? We, I mean, Amy noted earlier, right? We are living in a society that are so insecure and we are all freaking out. Believe me, I am freaking out as well, right? But, but how do we really, right, remove these noise or reduce this noise and focusing on this positive intellectual outputs, right? And that's something that I think we all should think about. And I really want to encourage my uh, students and my colleagues here that how important libraries can provide information that you will need, right? Lastly, Amy, not only we provide information, we preserve information. So as much as it is important for us to celebrating our students' accomplishment through this event, it is so important for us to preserve your work. So you all signed consent uh, at the, you know, when you apply for this award. We're going we're gonna to preserve your data or your research, and that's going to go to our institutional repository where they, it's going to be forever. So if you want to, <laughs> you somehow your computer crashed and you lost your stuff, we're going to have your stuff in addition to the recordings that they were recording today, right? Thank you so much for coming and celebrating our students' success. Please enjoy the refreshment and mingle.